I greet you all and welcome you to this service of evening prayer and Visio Divina. If you have the material I sent out, I invite you to join me now in the opening sentences. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening and the day is almost over. In the city of God, night shall be no more. They need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. God of gods, light of lights, we give you thanks and praise for your wisdom and steadfast love. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Bless and keep us this night, O Lord. Hold us in your gentle hand and lead us in your everlasting way. Through Christ Jesus, our Savior, and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let my prayer rise up like incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. O God, I call to you. Let us pray. Loving God, give us times of refreshment and peace in the course of this busy life. Grant that we may use our leisure to rebuild our bodies and renew our minds 
so that our spirits may be opened to the goodness of all your creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The scripture tonight comes from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And in this passage, we'll hear about Mary and Martha and their encounter with Jesus. So as I read through this first time, I invite you to listen attentively and pay attention to words or phrases that hold your attention. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so that she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Let us now pause for a few moments to reflect on this reading in silence. Amen. Now, as I read through it again, the illumination will appear on the screen, and I invite you to contemplate that as I read the passage a second time. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so that she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. You are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Amen. Now, as the image reappears on the screen, I invite you to contemplate it as I share the guided reflection. Jesus taught with many parables, and this anthology page captures some of the most beloved parables in the Gospel of Luke. At the right are Mary and Martha listening to Jesus and the words, there is no, there is need of only one thing, from Luke 10, 42. That one thing is to listen, and Mary has chosen the better part. Here, Martha stands in her apron with her hands on her hips and looks impatient, but at the same time, she is, like her sister, seated beside her, also gazing at the Lord. Martha and Mary are two sides of love and care, 
two images of hospitality, a value that is central to the Benedictine tradition. St. John's Abbey, which commissioned this Bible, is Benedictine. The rule of St. Benedict instructs the monks to welcome all visitors as if they were Christ himself. The parables portrayed here are all about love and care as well. The parable of the Good Samaritan is represented by text from the story. We hear of those who passed by and of the Samaritan who stopped. These quotations draw attention to the sectarian nature of the tale. The priest and Levite both have high status within Judaism. Priests would have been at the top of the social hierarchy and served at the temple, but Levites were descendants of the tribe of Israel, set aside as priests and charged with special duties. The Samaritan, on the other hand, is lower even than tax collectors and sinners, seen as ethnically inferior, thought to have no privileged relationship to God or understanding of what is good. At the center is a vision of compassion. A Samaritan was moved and bandaged his wounds. This quote leads our eye to the image in gold of the Twin Towers. Donald Jackson, the illuminator, was working on this illumination on September 11th, 2001. Why do you think this image is in gold? Why is it located between the parables of the lost son, the good Samaritan, and Dives and Lazarus? The parable of the lost son is all about forgiveness, said Jackson. He used the image of the Twin Towers as a contemporary example of the challenge of forgiving evil. You're really challenged to overcome your anger. It's got to be really difficult to forgive. It is an example, he said, representing the difficulty of achieving pure, unreasonable love. In the parable, we see a father's love for his wayward son, here painted by the artist Aidan Hart. But what a radical step to apply that same love to the entire human family. The Good Samaritan is this kind of story too. Love that passes boundaries Love for the other without fear. How else is the theme of lost and found played out in this illumination? Nine ghostly coins dance around the moon-like lost coin. Which is more precious? The lost sheep looks from darkness toward the angels and God's love. What do you think of this sheep? It is not moving toward the light, but needs the shepherd to come even further to restore its place with the others. Again, we see divine love that goes beyond reason. Still, the illumination is not without a scene of judgment. At the bottom is Dives, the wealthy man, who did not attend to the beggar Lazarus at his door. Now he claws at the banner scene. Do you see a vision of those still on earth or of hell? He seems crushed by the weight of it, as he now asks Lazarus, finally confronted in the arms of Abraham, for assistance. Or has he wrenched the banner from its diagonal place as a sign of his desperation that the others be warned? Lazarus, meanwhile, is comforted by Abraham and tended to by angels. Above them is the Hebrew word Abraham, taking us back to the genealogy of Matthew, 
reminding us of Christ's presence in all these stories. Pieces of the mandala from Matthew's genealogy are here again, worked into the diagonals and border by Sally Mae Joseph. They are meant, according to Jackson, to suggest the way the mind and intelligence work to interpret and understand concepts like teasing out the meaning of parables and applying them to our contemporary lives. Now that you've explored the illumination, what are other aspects of the relationship between Martha and Mary and the parables? Amen. Let us now pause once again and reflect on the illumination in silence. Amen. As we go to God together in prayer now, some of those we'll want to remember include uh, Bruce and Linda, Ruth and Jack. Let us continue to remember Anne, and then also Eva and Ellen Mortensen as she recovers from surgery. Others that we'll want to remember include school administrators, both in colleges, universities, and in high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools. Um, we'll want to remember teachers and then parents and students as well as they contemplate uh, decisions about in-person studies this fall. And we'll also remember our sister churches in Asia as we pray. So mindful of all of these then and others, let us go to God together in prayer. Give us your peace, O God that we may rejoice in your goodness to us and to all your children and be thankful for your love revealed in Jesus Christ. Especially we thank you for those who tend fields, orchards, and vineyards. We thank you for those who maintain public parks. We thank you for good leadership from public officials, especially public health directors, and Julie Pride. We pray, we thank you for blooming flowers, trees, and lush green prairie. We thank you for friends with whom we have shared. We thank you for the courage to be bold disciples. We thank you for the labors of those who have helped us. Give us your peace, O God that we may be confident of your care for us and all your children as we remember the needs of others. Especially tonight, we pray for the church in Asia, especially in China and North and South Korea. We pray for economic and labor justice. We pray for school administrators, teachers, students, and parents. We pray for those who are poor or vulnerable. We pray for agents of caring and relief, especially first responders, nurses, physicians, and medical staff. We pray for those we know and love, especially Linda and Bruce, Ruth and Jack, Anne, Eva, and Ellen. God, our shepherd, you have brought us through this day to a time of reflection and rest. Calm our souls and refresh us with your peace. Keep us close to Christ and draw us closer to one another 
in the bonds of his wonderful love. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now in the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together as our Lord taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now, may the Lord, who is our peace, give us peace at all times and in every way. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Go in peace now, and may God grant us all a good night's rest and peace at the last. Amen.